Thank you so much and welcome to my session. So this is a session called Position for Function in Long-Term Care. I am Anna Sokol. I am a nurse. Master's prepared, you can see that uh, there is a bit of a mix of education there. Somebody can question what is the nurse doing at the Sydney Symposium. So uh, <laughs> if you add a kinesiology ingredient to the recipe, I think it could be a pretty palatable result. So here I am. Uh, my background is in acute care and in rehabilitation, both adults and kids, and in management in home care and long-term care. And uh, I do have specializations in diabetes education, adult education, and wound ostomy continent specialty. So it makes me really, really passionate about the wounds you can understand. Um, for those of you wondering what my accent is, I have a Russian-Ukrainian background. I promise I'm friendly. <laughs> okay. The learning objectives for today, we're going to be discussing functional goals for the wheelchair user in the long-term care environment. And I'm going to make it very broad, not just long-term care facilities, but long-term care can take place anywhere right now, including homes. We're also going to be talking about factors affecting selection of seating in long-term care. And hopefully we, you'll finish the session with some ideas and examples of, of what you're going to be thinking, positioning your client. I do have to disclose conflict of, of interest. I am the employee, I'm the clinical educator working for Motion Concepts, which is the manufacturer of matrix seating line and power position systems were located in Canada. I am from Canada. And the images that will be shown, they will be describing to you the general clinical approaches and specific uh, ways of how we accommodated the client. But they're going to be using the examples of some matrix products. So when we think about the patients uh, who are getting admitted to the long-term care facility. What are the goals that we're formulating for them? From the clinical point of view, when we are clinicians, when we are directors of care, nurses, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, working at the facility or organization of providing care, we have the goals, they are clinical. We're making sure that client's medical needs are met. We're making sure that personal care and assistance needs are met. We also have to make sure that the patient is as active as possible. But if you think about it, it's all about client safety and overarching priorities for the organization to make sure the clients are safe, to make sure that there are no accidents or adverse events happening. So always, always, every organization is looking at the priority metrics such as number of falls, number of pressure injuries, number of infections contracted there. And this is going to be something that you're going to have in mind when you're meeting the client for the first time. Obviously, there is also a goal for participation and for the patient to be around and talk to other people and to be as active as possible and hopefully to be able to go outside as well. But then when you ask a question, what does patient have in mind? What is their goal when they get admitted somewhere? We know that they are not always happy. They are sometimes scared. And when we want to know what's on their mind, this is an interesting study that was done recently that looked at subjective data. The people who were admitted to long-term care services recently over few weeks or months, they were interviewed, and this was taking place in the states of Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New York, you can see, and they were asked, 464 patients were asked, all the adults mo mostly, what is it that you see is a goal for you here? So they're all talking about different things, but the researchers, they put together very common themes. The theme of maintaining function optimizing health and circumstances. This is interesting, right? So when we're talking about patients who need long-term care, right from the start, we know this is a person who probably has a lot of limitations, has a lot of comorbidities, 
And some organs are present, some are not. Maybe some are functioning, some are not. There may be not all limbs present. So they know their limitations, but they want to make sure that they function into the best of their ability with the limitations that they have. They're all looking for the quality of life and engagement. They don't want to be alone, but they also want to be safe and secure. This is the main cause of people getting admitted to long-term care services because they're no longer safe on their own. So one of the themes also that uh, popped up in this research was about cognitive function and capacity for social and emotional health. I like how they formulated this, capacity for emotional health. What does it mean in real life? We want to make sure that our clients are happy or at least trying to be close to that feeling of feeling content and happy. And in order for them to feel this, there are so many things that have to happen for them. And we have to make sure that they're comfortable. So I'm going to be presenting you several cases of real patients that I was working with over the past uh, one and a half years. And I hope that you're going to take something useful from this. Uh, first case is of uh, Mr. Singh, 92-year-old. Um, he is a gentleman in one of the long-term care facilities in uh, Ontario, uh, Scarborough. And uh, this is a home in, in Canada and in, in Ontario particularly. Every home has several divisions inside the building. So they have the privately funded section, they have the publicly funded section, they have the subsidized one, like a mixed one. So he was admitted to the private section because uh, the family wanted to make sure that he has a private room. So why was it this decision made? Over the course of five months, he had a lot of falls at home. He was living in, uh, with his daughter. He was afraid that he feels lightheaded, he is not having balance, and the daughter was mentioning to uh, her sisters and brothers saying, hey, the dad is no longer going outside the apartment. He doesn't want to go to the kitchen. He's kind of stuck in the room. He doesn't want to leave the bed. And that it progressed to the point that he stopped eating. At that point, the family was alarmed and saying, OK, let's, let's take him to the hospital. Sure enough, at the hospital, he was diagnosed with pulmonary emboli. He was uh, diagnosed with multiple other clots in different places, so he was getting treatment there. He spent two months at the hospital overall. After two months of all these treatments, being in bed, completely deconditioned, the medical team says, we can't discharge him back home. He is not able to ambulate. We have to discharge him to the long-term care facility. And what happened is that he got discharged uh, and admitted to the long-term care facility uh, because he was just very weak. He was very frail. So we know, probably some of you who attended my complete solution session, you know that I love the topic of balance and proprioception. So when we look at falls and why people fall, there are multiple factors in place. Seniors, they have vision loss. There is frailty and loss of muscle in place. Some of them, at least maybe in Canada, we know a lot of holy pharmacy, most of them are on a lot of medications. Some for blood pressure, some for diabetes, some for some neurological impairments. And in combination, the side effects make the person very lightheaded. So arthritic changes in the joints it's an interesting thing that we know now that they actually lead to loss of proprioception as well. There's a lot of pain that affects the ability of a person to be stable as well. There's also pulmonary and cardiovascular uh, factors. And I'm not even going to be spending time on, on strokes and other uh, conditions. We all know about them. The assistive devices, almost everybody in long-term care uses assistive devices. And almost everybody has some form or degree of cognitive or psychological condition. All of these conditions together, they are linked to poor balance. This is why we know that in long-term care homes, people do fall. 
So with Mr. Singh, he is admitted to the hospital, or oh, sorry, to the long-term care facility. And uh, in this particular case, the wait time for the prescribed chair was about two weeks. Not bad, actually, for Canadian standards. And he was given the loaner chair. So this means some chairs are actually present on the floors at the long-term care facility. And the occupational therapists and physiotherapists, they can actually try something. So more or less his size, he was given the chair, which uh, has a metal frame, has upholstery, slim upholstery seat, and uh, they placed the air cushion you can see, and they placed the rigid back there. So this is an unusual scenario for Canada. The main prescriber for the wheelchair in this facility was physiotherapist. Physiotherapists in Canada, uh, in some jurisdictions, recently were granted permission to get certified for the ADP system in Ontario particularly, they can actually prescribe the seating system. So this was the physiotherapist having the full physiotherapy team at his disposal. And he said, I'm going to assign two PTAs, physiotherapy assistants, to Mr. Singh, and we're going to see what we can do. But I actually want to change something. We were looking at him for one week. We see no progress. He is refusing to even try to get up with two PTAs. He's absolutely not moving, and we need stable seating systems. So this is the time that they were reaching out to the AT supplier, and they were requesting the stable cushion. So this scenario is actually classic. Person falls. They are afraid of falling because they're afraid of falling. They stop moving completely. They get deconditioned, sure enough. They refuse to move. There are no muscles. There's no balance training happening. Of course, they're going to fall again. To break this cycle, you need to start from fear of falling. You actually have to address that. How can we address the fear of falling? Give the person a stable seating system. This is how it's going to start. And then when they start trusting the wheelchair, they're going to start working with the physiotherapist. And then maybe he's going to trust his PTAs and be like, OK, let's try to get up. Let's try to move. Let me try to propel that chair. So sure enough, this is what happened. I put some timeline here. You can see that this is two weeks later. So the physiotherapy team had Mr. Singh on to a cycling program in their gym. And then some foot propelling was the actually goal. They said, Mr. Singh, you need to propel. And the goal was, let's start doing it for 10 minutes. So the cushion that was selecting, they selected the combo cushion, which is a foam and polymer, contoured cushion, fairly low profile, with the uh, waterfall edge. This waterfall edge allows you to maximize the contact area with the cushion so that you have some protection and distributing the pressure. So you have skin protection properties. This is a skin protection positioning cushion. And also, still, the person can propel, and you don't have any restriction in the person's um, range of motion if they need to tuck the feet under the chair. So the chair that they chosen, um, I don't know if it's the same terminology in the United States, we call it dynamic tilt chair. So this is a situation where the person can still reach the floor, can foot propel, but this is the chair that can go into tilt if needed. The reason for this selection was because nobody knew whether Mr. Singh will be improving or deteriorating. Yes? Yeah, and this is a tilt chair that pivots at the knee, so you maintain the seat floor height. Yes. Regardless of its own. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm not allowed to say the names of a product. I I'm trying. <laughs> yes. Sorry, you had another question there? Uh, let me ask you, can we please have questions at the end? Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> because I know that uh, if somebody is asking a question without the mic, then it doesn't get um, uh, to the system. I guess we're streaming today. So, this in this situation, with Mr. Singh, uh, he got the uh, standard contoured back that was high enough so that it had, a, it had a sufficient contour to support the shoulder. So when he was going to in, into tilt, 
the arms, the shoulders were supported. And yes, you could still touch the floor because for Mr. Singh, number one issue was fear. He wanted to make sure that he's not falling again. So when somebody is working with patients, and I'm gonna move this a little bit just because it looks like I cannot turn my head to the left. Can you hear me when I do this? No? Okay, maybe this is better. Okay. <laughs> so, um, probably the first thing I notice when I go in a long term care uh, facility is uh, a lot of patients sitting this way. The headrest is set up in such a way that the person's head is pushed forward. So, I have a bit of a trick that I'm using, and yes, it's probably related to the luxury of working with a headrest that's adjustable, but when the person is requiring the headrest, I set it up when the position of the chair is tilted. So the chair is tilted, I set up where the person's gonna be comfortable, and my personal practice is, is I make sure that they sit like this for 10 to 20 minutes to make sure that they're comfortable in tilt. Because after that, they're gonna be going up and you probably at the perfect spot. If person is comfortable in tilt and then you're sitting up, the headrest will be in most cases positioned the right way. So you can see the first scenario here with a bit of a angle you can see that that person is pushed forward and the second scenario when it's set up right the trick to do it right was for me to go into tilt make sure person is comfortable in tilt and then bring it back, back up right um i don't know if this is gonna play i want this video to play it doesn't play huh it's not playing now oh go back and go I'm trying. Now it's playing. No, it's playing. It's playing there. Okay, it's somewhere. So, okay. So sometimes I hear, "Oh, this headrest is too small. It's not deep enough for kyphosis." A lot of headrests are designed in the way that you can actually move the posts do it like a mount, forward mounting and then you can reach this is an example of a person you can see this is a mark kyphosis he has a c3 fracture and he has metal stands going from c3 to c6 there is no flexibility in the neck and he's constantly in pain so working with patients like this i need to make sure that he's going to be comfortable and how do you know if this is the headrest that has sufficient depth you start from them, yes, sitting upright. And in this situation, I forward mounted the headrest and I went forward and said, okay, I'm gonna reach that decent depth that I need for him. The next step I'm gonna be doing, yes, I'm gonna go into tilt and I'm gonna make sure that he's comfortable in tilt. And only after that, I'm gonna bring him up again. And if I know that he is comfortable or at least not having additional pain, then I'm going to sleep well, knowing I left him in a good position. So I'm going to go to the next one. Back to Mr. Sink. Remember that we had no idea, either, even any potential for him to improve, was it there or no? Because the trajectory for long-term care patients is usually to decline. So it's a steady decline. But here we have an unusual situation. We have a very motivated group of recently hired physiotherapists who believe in rehabilitation and believe that every person can improve. They were working hard. So this is an interesting example where five weeks later, with continuous training, actually Mr. Singh started walking. Not only that, this is the video that his family sent and said we want to I'm sorry, I had to block his face because uh, uh, I don't know who's using this slide online. I have permissions for the conference, but I have to protect the patient. So he is smiling on this video, and this is the first smile in nine months that family caught. So one of the other interesting things when we talk about patients, 
the nursing staff and PSW staff thought that there was a language barrier. He was not verbal. But we knew he's from Guyana. In Guyana, English is the first language. And because we knew him from before, he was a public speaker, his very prominent figure in his community. There is no English problem. So family was absolutely motivated to do the best for their dad because they knew that he can speak and they want to hear him speak again. So this was the Christmas video when he was smiling, he started talking again. So what does it tell us? This is how deep the depression was. This was depression that made him absolutely nonverbal. So because he's diabetic and I always look at the nursing indicators, when I got the message from nurses that his blood pressure medication dosages decreased, his diabetes dosages decreased, and other painkillers dosages were decreased, this is a win-win for me everywhere. So I call this a success of working with the patient. But it, yes, it does require a lot of attention and many, many hours of attention to the client. So for Mr. Singh, the final system that he got with the right side was an 18 inch wide wheelchair. But because he has an apple shape, to increase the proprioception and maximize his, his belief in his wheelchair system, we actually had to match him with 19 inch wide back. So having the hardware that allows for that is actually very helpful. Um, so other than that, we also had the cushion from the stable skin protection positioning cushion that I mentioned before, and that adjustable mounting hardware uh, with the head support, that's the one that stayed with him. When you work with patients who are at the facility with long-term care, usually clinicians ask, give me the products that are no maintenance or low maintenance. So having products that don't require any gauging, adjustment, and all of that, this is actually very helpful for them. And I'm not talking about infection control, OK? Cleaning clinics are must, OK? <laughs> We're not talking about that. We're talking about adjustments uh, other than that. Um, it is ideal if you think about skin protection and positioning cushions for patients, because they have certain features in place. They have immersion and envelopment um, properties uh, that are required for skin protection, and some of them have a floating as well, but also they have the preitial bar. That is what allowing these cushions to be in that category. Preitial bar means it prevents the sliding out from the cushion. By working with long-term care homes and knowing that the products you provided actually addresses their priority as well, it's making life easier for everybody. When somebody says, but wait a second, what about the weight? It's actually very helpful to think about the weight, provide the light system, light cushion, light back, because think about these patients, they all have issues in their joints. Not only they now have to use their arms to carry their own weight, propel the chair. If you give them heavy cushion and heavy back, that's going to be additional strain on already diseased joints. And yes, it has to be stable. Start addressing fear of falling. Start from the stable system. I'm going to switch my topic to the foam. And I'm allowed to talk about the product a little bit. A matrix introduced the E2 back three years ago, and it featured the ripple foam. Ripple foam uh, was meant to work uh, in both ways, to improve the immersion along the spinal area specifically, and also to try and address thermoregulation. We actually found that this design decreased the temperature and decreased rate of sweating in patients. But most importantly, we were looking at how would this type of foam improve immersion, and how would it be applicable to our long-term care patients? So we had a number of studies done with pressure mapping. And for those of you know, in our line, we have the TR back that has the super soft foam, which is two inches thick, and it's very comfortable. Usually people 
choose that one for people in tilt recline applications for comfort. There is this perception that this form is very comfortable. This is what patients should be on. So we were doing a number of pressure mapping studies and comparing that form in tilt with the ripple form. So this is an interesting example of a female who had a pronounced kyphosis and had protruding spinal processes. Uh, this is a T6 and T7. You could visually see it. You can palpate it. She was very skinny. You can actually see that, oh my god, it could be a problem if she's left supine for a long time, unless this is a proper form that's given to her. So you see how on the super soft form, it actually, she loads on them. And then we tried the ripple form, and you can't even see where those protruding processes are. So just to give you a bit of a glimpse into the innovation, that there is some different approaches to working with patients with bony prominences and making sure that they are safe. This is another example, 45 degree tilt. And uh, we work with patients who had issues, not just with lumbar disc, this is a non-flexible issue with lumbar area. And he did have pronounced kyphosis. Shoulders were an issue. He was constantly complaining of shoulder pain. So not only the peak pressures were reduced with the ripple form, we also got an interesting feedback. When we have a lot of foam in the back support, it actually pushes in some areas where people wouldn't like it to be pushed, particularly in shoulders when they in tilt, they don't want to feel this feeling, and also in the flank area. So this was some consistent findings when we were comparing the two. And the E2 back shell is more fitted. We kind of like to think about it as more sporty, but because it feeds better, it actually distributes the weight better in tilt. So just park that thought that there are some products that are available for you, and there are some new approaches that can help you to work with patients in long-term care settings or those receiving services at home. I'm going to take you to the next case study, Loretta. Uh, we're talking about the long-term care uh, facility case again. Typical scenario, this scenario is from the United States. I think it's called assistive living facility in the United States. Am I right? Uh, that means it's publicly funded, right? No, doesn't mean that? Okay, sorry. I'm going to have to learn more about that. <laughs> so also the situation when the loan chair was provided. So it was provided for a patient on a temporary basis, but it turned out that she couldn't actually have the other one. So some modification had to be done to this one. So what was happening is she had a very low seating tolerance. And you can see she is sitting on a metal frame chair with a slim upholstery, and the back is the material as well. Not very supportive. There is a kyphosis, and she is sitting in posterior tilt here. She could not even tolerate the elevator ride from the room to the dining area. So also what happens with our patients who have marked kyphosis, notice how the position of the neck is affected. They're always going to be either in extended neck position, trying to maintain the gaze, trying to have the eye contact, or they're not going to be able to do it, and they're going to be complaining of neck pain, and they're going to be staring on the floor all the time. This is not good for socializing. So what do we do in this situation? It actually, one of the approaches that could be used that you can open the seat to back angle, and you can support the back to the level of the apex of kyphosis, and this is what was done in her situation. But also, the proper cushion has to be provided. She had to have a proper support, and it had to be deep enough. And she is a fairly tall lady here. So this is another interesting thing. You can see how her knees are very close together. This is very typical of females. There was another study done recently, and it was found that females actually tend to see this way, and that increases the risk of falling when they need to do the seat to stand transfer. So we had to make sure that she's getting the contour of the cushion 
that would be pronounced enough would have the sufficient abductor to make sure that we are maintaining the proper alignment there. Plus, in this situation, when person sits with this kind of rotation, you're always going to have higher peak pressures at the ischial tuberosity. So she's going to be at risk for the pressure injury. So you can see that her arm rests too high, right? She can't be comfortable in this situation. Not the best chair for her. So in her situation, she was provided with the deep contour back. Uh, sorry, the standard contour back and the deep contour cushion. And how did we, did we address this? It was the combination of foam fluid cushion. Some of you can recognize what kind of product that is. It has the additional abductor put in. So this is one of the things that you can have access to from the feed kit for this cushion. So you can actually increase abduction. So what is the outcome measurement for this situation? You're going to be looking at what would be the goal in this situation. We want to make sure she's comfortable. We want to make sure that she has a better seating tolerance. We want to make sure that she can make it through her dinner and, and the socialization activities. So that was a success story as well, because she was able to tolerate two hours. Are we OK so far? Because I'm going to take you to another uh, case study. Are we good on time? Wonderful. And I'm actually midway. Nancy, this is the 78-year-old lady uh, I met about half a year ago. Um, absolutely the longest list of diagnosis I've seen in my life. She has so many comorbidities. Parkinson's osteoporosis, uh, scoliosis that she's been living with all her life, kyphosis there as well, history of multiple falls. She's on multiple medications, more than 10 per day. And she was admitted to the hospital because she had another fall. And that fall resulted in the C7 fracture in the left hip fracture and dislocation and the right shoulder somehow was damaged too but somebody says that it was damaged before that fall so we're talking about the patient who is in extreme pain all the time the hospital the, the surgeons orthopedic surgeons look at her and said there is no way we can do anything here we cannot repair that there is not enough bone mass to put the metal stands in. The osteoporosis is so pronounced, nothing is gonna hold. So she was discharged home with the publicly funded home support, personal support worker assistance. And essentially the recommendation was just make sure she's comfortable. So she is back at home at her apartment, living with her husband and receiving care, but she required the wheelchair. In this situation, the waiting line for the occupational therapist who need to um, prescribe the wheelchair, this is Ontario case, was about eight months. So the services said, you got to be better going and hiring your private occupational therapist. It's going to be much faster. So in the week time, they were able to arrange the provider of equipment and the occupational therapist coming over for trial of assessment assessment and trial of equipment. So what happened there? Uh, she, she first was um, provided with the contoured soft foam cushion, but you can see it wasn't deep enough. She was also provided with the contoured back that was a little bit tall. And she was saying, no, I have pain. That lateral of the back is pushing my shoulder. This is too much. I can't tolerate it. And I feel pain in my left hip. I cannot sit. I cannot propel. I'm not comfortable. So the approach was taken on the second visit. So they, we were all consulting and thinking what would be the best for her. We thought maybe let's go with more of a planar back with the form that would be more of a forgiving and more immersive for her. And thinking that maybe that's going to work. So this was a five inch deep 
pointed rigid back, but more of a planar type of a back. And it was 1816 size wise. Now, if you take a look at the green line, the green line is where the hardware for the back is. The yellow line, this is where my canes and my chair is. So this is like your reference point. So if you take a look in the red line, red line is drawn between the left shoulder and the right shoulder. That is extreme, right? The right shoulder is so far to the front, you cannot see it unless you start palpating and realizing, wait a second, the shoulder is actually in the front. So what we have to do then, like, okay, let's change the approach. What if we try the contoured back of the lower height and let's try rotating that back so that within the canes, it's gonna be rotated by 20 degrees. This is what we did. So let's try to make that work for her. So this is actually a much better approach that happened. So in the planar back, you would think that what could be a problem? You see how the scapula is rotated forward and there was a nerve at the edge of the scapula on the inferior front. And it was actually that area was in touch with the corner of the back. And that was like, that nerve was being pressed. She wasn't comfortable. So for her, that gentle contour with the clearance for the shoulder worked better because it wasn't pressing on her nerve. So another thing you can see, this is a shot from uh, above. You see how she's sitting in the chair. It's called twin swept. So she's to the side. And this is because of that rotation. There is a pelvic rotation. There is a, there is a spinal rotation happening. And this is the only way she's going to be sitting. She is not flexible. This is fixed. So on the right side, you see the small distance between the edge of the cushion and the popliteal area. On the left side, that distance is very large. So you were thinking, OK, how about we try the deep cushion? We actually gave you a cushion which was four inches deeper than we thought she needed originally. And miraculously, it worked. So this was the three-layer, uh, multi-dense, very, very soft cushion, but still had the pronounced contour and still had that pre bar to prevent sliding out. One issue with Nancy was that she was sliding out from the chair a lot. And uh, in, in Ontario particularly, if somebody is, is assigned home care services and assigned the PSW, personal support services, and the task is, hey, you have to take this person outside for fresh air every day, the protocol states, if person is sliding out and not secured with the seat belt, the PSW is not allowed to take the person anywhere. You have to make sure that person is stable in the wheelchair system. So she couldn't tolerate it. Just imagine the left hip is already dislocated and broken. She couldn't tolerate anything there, nothing in her femoral area. So this was the situation it's like, okay, we gotta be innovative here. So what was tried is yes, deeper cushion, yes, shorter back. Um, yes, we had to move the uh, axle forward because she had to reach uh, the wheel. Uh, thanks to the hardware, we actually could fine tune the, the height of the back to make sure it's sitting where she would be comfortable. But also we added the posture flex abdominal support, that neoprene flexible anterior abdominal support that was moving with her, was not restricting her breathing, but this is secured to the back. She could still be safe in the chair. She was not sliding out and she could be taken outside for walks. So this is something that you need to think about whether you're dealing with restraint or not restraint. It is designed to be opened freely, have the special point there that it's easier to be free from it. So I don't know about the United States and Canada, the definition of restraint has changed. And it's precisely stating it's about the person's abilities, it's not about the device. If person can easily remove it, it's not a restraint. So in her situation, this is not a restraint, this is a positioning support device. And this is exactly how it was designed. 
So that is something that worked with her. And then on the last visit, we actually decreased the rotation. Remember that back was originally rotated by 20 degrees. We actually decreased it back. It was only 10 degrees now. But this is the final picture that you can see from above. So she is sitting more comfortable. My criteria of success that the dose of pain medication is reduced because I want her to be alert more time, not just one hour per day. So that was my criteria of success. Well, okay, so far, I'm gonna take you to my last study. I wouldn't be a nurse if I wouldn't be talking about uh, wound, wounds and uh, wound care. I have to talk about wounds. Uh, Michael, 54 year old, he lives in downtown Toronto in a special building designed for people with mobility issues. And it's a special program where people with um, spinal cord injuries get assistance at home. So they have the morning help of a personal support worker coming up, helping with ADLs, and then they have the person coming over in the evening as well. And he also has a lot of friends. Very active. He's been living with spinal cord injury, very high, C3 incomplete, for 34 years. So we're talking about this case as a success case, because as he uh, mentioned to me two weeks ago, he said, Anna, you know, all my friends are dead now. I don't have anybody in my circle who outlives anything. They all had, had actually pressure injuries and they're not with me. I'm the only one standing. He was very careful. He, for years, you can imagine 30 years, he was proud of never ever having a pressure injury. He was going to the gym, he was floating, he had a power chair, he was tilting it. He absolutely, when you speak to him, he was doing all of this leaning maneuvers while he's talking to you. It was an excellent example of doing everything according to the book until COVID hit. COVID hit and his gym was closed. He wasn't allowed to go there and do anything. Uh, the place where he was volunteering in the school board was closed as well. He was absolutely stuck at home in the building. So these are the pictures that um, um, I was actually happy that his friend was taking it um, because it started, you can see that September 2020 picture. It started as a maceration and it started because the personal support worker in the morning and evening, the ones that are supposed to come in, they were not coming, they were down with COVID. So you're talking about a person who is incontinent and that means when the incontinence products are not changed, there's a lot of moisture there, plus something that we don't want for the skin. If it's not cleaned properly and not cleaned on time, then you're gonna have issues with skin. So unfortunately, Michael is the person who never asks for help. He thought that nurses are needed at the hospital because it's COVID time. And he discharged him his, his own nursing home support services. And he said, it's okay, I don't need you. Focus on other patients who are sicker than me. For half a year, what he was doing, he was patching it with some tape from regular pharmacy. And this, what you see in here, is the most associated skin damage with the medical adhesive injury because the tape he was using was not proper. So every time he was removing the dressing, he was actually injuring the skin even more. Sure enough, it actually became the deep pressure injury all the way with tunneling and going all the way to the bone. Thank God he didn't have osteopor oster oh my God, osteomyelitis. So we're dealing with a deep pressure injury here. So, we're kind of keeping in touch. Our team was keeping in touch over the years with him. Talking about half a year after, he decides to call me. It's like, Anna, I just want to talk to you. Like, there is a minor issue. 
And I'm wondering, maybe I can run it by you since you wound lost to me continents and earth, maybe we can talk about something. And, you know, I ask the right questions. And what did they discover during that conversation? He never believed in the proper lumbar support. He was using the blood pressure cuff that he was inflating, and he was using that blood pressure cuff for years. He said that works without failure until it didn't. So he tells me, oh, yeah, I didn't notice right away. My blood pressure cuff broke, and I no longer have the lumbar support. And I'm like, Michael, you do have to have a lumbar support. Just make sure that, that, that the therapist working with you, that places the proper lumbar support there. So look at this date. This was an interesting thing. A week after the lumbar support was installed, he is texting back that his wound finally started closing. If you think about it, the magnitude of just the proper lumbar support, you're reorienting the pelvis from the posterior to more neutral position. You're right away cutting all those shear forces. You're making them probably half lower. And this can make a difference for the person. And yes, I was not nice to him saying, you need a nurse. You better get your nurse back. Okay, because without nursing, without proper cleaning and debridement, this is no way to heal this wound. This is a complicated, infected, in duration happening. You gotta clean it. You're gonna make sure that you have the best chance of healing it. And I was happy to hear that he went to the wound care clinic at the hospital and he was taken right away. So one and a half years later, I'm following up saying, hey, how are you doing? How's your wound? And he sends me the picture. And you see how long it took to heal, but it's still not healed. It still has a little bit of a spot. So you got to be careful speaking, speaking to patients because this is actually a huge achievement for somebody who is quadriplegic, somebody who is on a wheelchair, to heal to this level. This is a huge achievement, and they're very proud of it. So my first instinct was, hey, oh, you still have a hole. Now I stopped myself and said, oh my god, congratulations. This is amazing. It's actually getting to the closure. So when we look at the latest NPIP guidelines, what do we know in terms of recommendations? They say, use a pressure distribution cushion for preventing pressure injuries in people at high risk who are seated in a chair wheelchair for prolonged periods, particularly if the individual is unable to perform pressure relieving maneuvers. Of course, he was placed on the adjustable skin protection and position cushion. Uh, you have to assess the skin under and around medical devices for signs of pressure-related injury and part of routine skin is a part of uh, routine skin assessment. Make sure that when you work with patients like this, ask them, the PSW performing care, do they check and do they have a protocol to check the skin and report back to the nursing supervisor what is the status of, of that wound in any other area? And I'm a nurse. And I'm a firm believer in addressing people. At least once a week, the nurse has to come over and address the patient and inspect all the areas of the skin, the whole body. If this is not done, you cannot be assured that everything is OK. So when somebody asks me, what is this? And I know, guys, you probably know, adjustable skin protection positioning. This is a category that exists in the United States. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So when I am in Canada speaking to clinicians, they're like, what? What are you talking about? What does it even mean? So I explained to them that the skin protection cushions, they have to have all those properties of immersion, envelopment, and sufficient offloading. Offloading means that you have to elevate the person, and you have to load on areas that are safe and have to offload the areas that are at risk. So you have to look in sufficient trachanteric shelves when somebody is experiencing high risk or experiencing already the wound, because you have to give the best chance for that wound to heal. 
or the best chance for reperfusion so that the wound doesn't happen. The pelvic seat well has to be deep enough. And this is a picture that I like of a pelvis, which gives you an idea. There is about one and a half to two inch difference in height between the ischial tuberosities and the head of trochanter. So this is anatomically what we're dealing with. That means this is how deep the pelvic seat well should be in order to provide offloading for patients. If I am dealing with somebody like Michael, and I am a nurse, I always think about what kind of dressing does he have. The dressings could be different, and they're sometimes very bulky. So working together as a team helps because you need to understand that if additional offloading is possible, and if this is a situation where you can actually add it, that would be much helpful because you need to accommodate for all of those additional dressings that nurses put in. So this is, an, um, this is plain, right? Um, I am showing Libra adjust cushion here from the matrix line. So on itself, this is the cushion that provides the highest level of offloading in our line. But if you add additional silicone pads laterally, and I'm showing this because I want you to have that image in your mind that you adding on the side, you're never adding anything in the pelvic well. When you loading the person laterally, this is an opportunity to offload further and to give a chance for the wound to heal. And the idea here is that you're still not going to be floating in the air. Floating in the air is not good. So what is the recommendation that you can see uh, from the NPIP guidelines published in 2019? You have to reposition all individuals with or at risk of pressure injuries on an individualized schedule unless contraindicated. This is such a gray area. If you ask somebody how often for how long you need to offload, oh my goodness. If I go and look at recommendations from the PT association, OT association, from nursing papers, the variation is from two hours. And somebody had a speech yesterday saying this is uh, coming from Florence Nightingale, two hours, to somebody saying, oh, do it every 10 minutes. It's unrealistic every 10 minutes. So what I was looking at, I was looking at studies that would give me an idea how long does it take for tissues to reperfuse if offloaded. So the best number I got is that it takes three minutes of offloading for the blood to go back to that area. So it has to be as, as long as three minutes minimum and it could be a variety of offloading schedules. It could be by leaning. It could be by using the power chairs and all the tilt recline mechanisms. It could be in bed. It could be, it could be the standard too, right? For some people who can use the standard. But the idea is you have to offload the risky areas to give it a chance for safety and um, health. So with Michael, one year, eight months later, he still has this little bit of an opening. And we're still dealing with this wound and he is actually feeling very optimistic. But having that posterior tilt corrected by making sure you have the proper back support and proper lumbar, that was the key that changed the way that, uh, that his wound was actually progressing. So to end the session, I'd like to thank you for coming, first of all. <laughs> But I want to talk about what do you do for patients receiving long-term care? Yes, we have to meet their clinical needs. Yes, we have to make sure that all of these organizational priorities are met as well. We have to make sure the person is comfortable. We always have to talk to the individual and we have to make sure that we know what, what they're doing, where they're coming from, where do they see themselves in a month? I'd like to finish with a thought that the fact that the person is admitted to the long-term care facility or services or working with some support staff at home, that doesn't mean that trajectory is to decline. That doesn't mean that 
we're only going to be seeing some one way. There are so many ways to help people. There are so many ways to improve. Think about Mr. Singh, who started walking, started talking. Think about Michael, whose goal is to heal the wound, and actually he is back at his volunteering services. Uh, services. Somebody like Nancy, yes, it's terrible. The situation is absolutely terrible when somebody lives in pain. But to have that level of pain lowered, for her to stay alert and not to be on all those painkillers and to be able to have a conversation with her husband, that is actually very powerful for that family. So if we try to work with patients and we constantly think about safety and where they are and what kind of goals they have, I think we have a chance to win. Thank you.